Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. I thought I'd spend a few minutes today talking about where we're at after the end of the session. There were about 60 bills that passed during the last two weeks of the session. And as you know, at that time of year, things can change quickly or be added at the last minute without much notice. So as is typical, I won't be making any specific decisions on individual bills until we receive and review them using the five days I have to take action. And just for awareness, I don't have any bills on my desk at this point. Legislative Council will take whatever time they need to review the bills and get signatures from legislative leaders before I start getting bills, and they typically come in batches. That's a long way of saying uh, you shouldn't expect any action this week or early next week. Now, taking a step back in January, I presented a budget to the legislature that was balanced, prioritized Vermonters and communities, helped make Vermont more affordable with tax relief, and made investments in shared priorities like childcare, climate change mitigation, infrastructure, workforce, and more. The good news is the legislature included funding for most of those initiatives. The bad news is they spent a lot more money than I proposed and relied on regressive taxes and fees to fund the added spending, which I believe is unsustainable given the economic uncertainty ahead of us. As I've rep repeatedly said, we can make historic progress on our shared goals without increasing costs on already overburdened Vermonters. What I put forward was sustainable, something we can afford next year and into the future. And we can expand on those shared goals if we have re uh, organic revenue to, um, to uh, fill those uh, coffers. Uh, I've been clear. I'm ready and willing to work with legislators to find the right balance between their approach and mine, because that's what Vermonters elected us to do. As I said in my adjournment address, majority of Vermonters voted for me in the last election in every single town, uh, while also electing them. Vermonters voted for balance and expected us to work together. But they've also been loud and clear with me that they didn't think Vermont was affordable even before this legislative session. That's why I have serious concerns about the financial impacts of what they passed. Between $100 million payroll tax, $20 million in DMV fees, $30 million in property tax pressure, at least $180 million in potential clean heat mandates, that works out to roughly $1,200 per household per year. I worry about everyday Vermonters already facing cost increases due to inflation. I worry about lower income single moms who won't significantly benefit from what was passed this year, but will pay more in taxes and fees to help families with higher incomes. Or the seniors on fixed incomes who are already living on the edge and won't see any benefits, but will face higher costs. Now it's no secret I have some disagreement with the approach lawmakers have taken. So I'll once again make this appeal, which you and the press are now familiar with. We share the same goals. We both support making historic investments in shared priorities. But I believe we must do it in a way Vermonters can afford. We have five weeks between now and when they come back at the end of June. Vermonters want us to work together, and I'm ready to do just that. So with that, I'll open up to questions. In your um, goodbye speech to the House and Senate, uh, you reiterated some of your concerns with the legislation as it relates to spending and revenues. And you said, in this quest for balance, you hope that they will join you in this upcoming veto session to deliver that. What do you mean by that? Well, there's two paths forward uh, for them. Uh, they can seek to override um, my veto, which they've shown that they can successfully do, uh, or they can work with us uh, to try and find some middle ground, work together to compromise both sides, uh, giving some in order to do what I could find palatable. And uh, they could as well. So that's the, uh, that's the outreach. So you said at the outset, still got to look at the bills, haven't arrived at my desk yet, um, but it does sound like you anticipate 
vetoing some significant pieces of legislation? There are a number of bills I have concerns with. And again, um, we'll look at uh, take a look at all those and put them together, and I'll have to prioritize as well. I can't veto everything. Um, so I'll just have to make some decisions over the next couple of weeks. Don't um, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. How productive, you know, you've been around many sessions. How, how productive do you think this session was, fees and, and taxes aside, I mean, in terms of the legislation that was passed, how, how productive do you think it was? I guess it depends on your standpoint. Um, from my perspective, um, I think it did a lot of, a lot of harm uh, and could potentially do a lot of harm to everyday Vermonters. From their perspective, I, I think they uh, had a mandate when they came in and uh, they were going to move forward with that mandate and, uh, and they did so successfully. So again, I, I guess it depends on, on your perspective. How do you reconcile the two mandates? You were elected every town. And they, the, the people of Vermont elected, in theory anyway, veto-proof majorities in both chambers. Yeah, I mean, you have to look at it. That, they didn't do so knowingly or collectively. You know, they, each, each district elected their representative. Now, I don't know as any of them went to, said, we're going to go in and veto everything the, or override everything the, the governor vetoes. And, and uh, I, we don't expect you to listen to anything the governor has to say. I just think that they expected us to work together. And, and from my perspective, you know, I have a full view uh, of the state. Um, theirs is narrower than mine. And, um, and again, when you have a supermajority and have the power and, uh, and a lot of cash uh, because of the surpluses that we have, uh, it gives you the, the sense of, uh, uh, of being able to deliver. And, you know, it's not, I, I, I know Governor Cooper is facing the same thing in North Carolina today. Um, so uh, the opposite. Uh, he's a Democrat, and, uh, and they, he's facing a supermajority, and, and they overturned his veto as well. Uh, you mentioned when you were speaking about the young single mother. Um, wouldn't the young single mother be able to benefit from the child care? Um, well, they already are. Um, and they're not getting any increase, right? Like, so you have. There's a certain level of uh, poverty. I think it's 150% at this point, 200%, whatever, whatever the figure is. Uh, I'm thinking of that, uh, that single mom who's already receiving child care uh, and not paying for it. They aren't going to get any more than they get today, um, but they will have to pay for it because if they're working, they'll be paying a payroll tax. Five percent of federal poverty level. Now she does get free Yeah, and that's you know, and, and that's why my uh, bill that I put forward uh, included uh, went up to uh, almost four hundred percent of poverty level. So that would include them within uh, existing resources and not having uh, any payroll tax. So you know, again, I've said we're all going to have to compromise if they're willing. And uh, if that means going a little bit more, um, but but the, the long range goal is, I agree with them. I think we should have more, um, but we have to do it at a pace we can afford. Um, you stopped just short of saying that you plan to veto the budget, um, but you're also speaking as if you know it's all but certain that there's still an opportunity for them to reopen it, which there wouldn't be if you signed it into law or. Um, or let it pass into law with your, without your signature. Can we assume that you're going to veto the budget? Well, there's other ways of accomplishing that. And I don't have to get into all the intricacies, but um, there are other areas uh, of concern. And once you open up one bill, you can counteract what you've done in another. So there's, there's ways uh, of crafting legislation uh, to take care of something mm -hmm. without uh, without opening up the, the budget. But again, I'm, uh, I'm not saying I'm going to or not going to. I'm just going to take a look at all of them uh, to see, find a path forward. You said there's no bills on your desk right now. I thought you had the biodiversity bill. Am I wrong about that? Not that I'm aware of. OK. I've, everything, I'm, I'm just the, yeah, I've okay. signed everything that's come to my desk. That's when you rate this year's, um, it, it seems this philosophical difference between you and the, the legislature is not really new. 
Um, although th there are the new uh, powers, if you will, of the legislature. How would you rate this in your, what, what year is this? Uh, six years as governor, this, where we are right now. Um, they've all been different, obviously, uh, but I would, I would counter that, you know, we don't, our, our differences aren't philosophical because I'm in favor of increasing childcare. I'm in favor of doing more. I'm in favor of paid family leave. It's just our approach and how we do it and the pace at which we do it is of disagreement. So I don't know if that's philosophical, um, but I'm a, I'm a fiscal conservative. Uh, I've been in business a long time. I've, uh, I've been governor now for this, my seventh year. I've been in the legislature for a number of years before that. I've seen some downturns in the economy. I've, I've experienced that in business. I know how difficult it is when that happens, and it happens quickly. Uh, and I don't know as everyone in the legislature has experienced that. And all they've seen thus far, uh, for some, are the good times. You know, we've, we've had a, a surplus. We brought forward a, a surplus in the, in the state budget for the first time in a decade. Uh, over the last three or four years. We didn't have that before um, because we were rebounding from the, that economic downturn. So, so again, uh, I think it's the experience that I've had uh, in, in knowing what I do and knowing how difficult it is to make those cuts uh, leads me to want to you know, walk before you run and they're going from zero to 60 in one session. Acknowledging you haven't had an opportunity to review the legislation yet, um, how do you feel in concept about this idea of expanding the bottle redemption universe in order to increase the amount of Yeah, I, I've been opposed to, to that bill since the, I first heard about it and throughout my legislative life. Uh, I think what we, um, what we put forth um, decades ago uh, worked uh, and it was a good step forward. But now we have something all different with the recycling, zero sort, and so forth. And I think we should be focusing on that. I'm not saying we, we give up on bottle redemption in its entirety. Uh, but um, to grow it to this degree, I think, is, is going to have some consequences, um, workforce and otherwise, that we're not contemplating at this point. And, and I just I think it's the wrong approach. I think we should be focusing on recycling. Um, one of the arguments in favor of the legislation that would increase future legislatures' pay was that the, the current pay scale is just too paltry to allow regular Vermonters, for lack of a better word, to um, get into public service. Do, do you think there's merit to that argument? I think there's some merit, um, and I've been vocal about that as well. We, um, what I hear from when I'm trying to encourage someone to run for office, um, they typically ask me, you know, well, how much time does it take? And, and what about, what am I gonna have to do? When, how long is the session? And I have to answer honestly, because it's open-ended, don't know. It can be, I've been in here most into June uh, in one of our sessions when I was in the legislature. And so there's no, set time limit. And that's been the biggest deterrent in terms of trying to encourage people to run. Uh, the pay uh, for some is a, an issue. And, and I've said, if you want to raise the pay, um, that's fine. Uh, but you have to reduce the length of the session and have some a finality to that uh, so that they can plan for what they, when they were going to be here and for how long so they can get back to their normal lives and back to their own own jobs and be able to tell their employers how long they're going to be on. So two weeks from today, I know we've got an extended point on this before, but the hotel motel program will kind of go back to its expanded version. And city and town managers I've talked to just as recently as yesterday kind of have no idea what they're going to do with these influx of people coming back. I guess just do you have any message or anything you'd want to kind of tell local municipality leadership? Yeah, I mean, we're all in this together. Um, and it's something that we're not st sitting on our hands uh, waiting for the date to arrive before doing anything. Uh, we're trying to make arrangements at this point. Uh, it's permanent housing is the answer, and uh, and I, 
want to reiterate that uh, every dollar that we spend for the hotel motel program is, is money that we won't be able to utilize for permanent housing, typically. So we should be putting more money. Um, as you know, we, we put forward an, an initiative of $15 million for the VHIP program. Now, the VHIP program has been probably one of the most successful uh, programs we've initiated. And I don't think Vermonters uh, have a, a great idea of what that means. Uh, because if you have a home and you want to add an accessory dwelling or you have an apartment uh, that needs upgrading so you can rent it out, uh, there's uh, grants available for up to $50,000 with some stipulations attached. Now, we've only been doing this for a year or two at this point, uh, and we put 500 and something units online for uh, less than $50,000 per unit. When you compare that uh, to the money we put forward, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have done what we've done, but when we, when we put it into um, bigger projects, we're talking, you know, $250,000 or more uh, in terms of per unit cost, and it takes a lot longer. So we, uh, the pace at which we are able to react is going to be part of the answer. So I'd like, that's one area that I would like them to, instead of cutting uh, our, our request by $5 million, I think they, sh at this point in time, should expand upon that. Um, and, and we're just going to have to continue uh, to survey uh, those who are involved in the hotel motel program uh, to find out what plans they've made, if they've made any, uh, what uh, issues they have, and, and, and we're doing just that every single day. And I might ask um, Secretary Samuelson if she has anything she could add to that at this point. said you've been surveying them, talking with them. Um, how many of those individuals have you been able to confirm will have housing to transition to when they leave those motel rooms? We know a significant proportion of them actually have an alternative plan. Um, we talked about that last time that we were here. I mean, it's a dynamic population, so I don't want to get down to the, um, infinite, the finite or infinite number um, that has an alternative plan. But we do know that there's a significant proportion that do and are waiting um, until the program ends to implement that plan. Significant. I mean, can you, are you tracking this? Like, do you have data on this? Can you, is there a spreadsheet where you're keeping track of each individual and finding out what the, what the plan is? I'm happy to get back with you uh, on that, but we do, we are meeting actively, engaging in case management and care management with each individual and, and their families that would like to engage in, in that process. Um, so I can get back to you. In, in, the um, number, in the number of individuals that will lose elig eligibility beginning June 1? There, again, I'll, uh, there, it's a dynamic number. Um, so let me go ahead and I'll get those details back to you. Dynamic number, does that mean that you haven't fully decided who's going to be eligible and who's not going to be eligible? Is, are there still decision points ahead that are going to be determinative as to whether or not somebody can stay in their motel or hotel room? No, I think that that's an inaccurate um, statement. Um, it means that there are individuals who are coming and going from the program on a daily basis. Um, letters uh, went out to program individuals at the beginning of the month um, that will be exiting on June 1, and I give you the number of those letters um, following the press conference. I, I was struck by the number of, of, of families 
who had Section 8 vouchers that weren't able to find any. Um, I mean, I wasn't surprised, but, but I was struck by uh, the, just the sheer number. And that's what led me to believe that we need to do a better job in trying to promote the VHIP program. And uh, you could all help with that as well uh, to try to get the word out. And we can, uh, we can identify, um, just point them our way um, so that we can, we can get them if they have a, that would help them as well for some struggling families trying to pay their property taxes. Uh, this would be another approach uh, to helping uh, supplement that as well. Um, the other uh, part of that was the number of people, not a great number, but the, there's a number of people in the hotel motel program that would qualify uh, for senior living of some sort. Uh, and they just aren't quite ready to give up their independence, uh, but, um, but they would qualify for that. So we are actively pursuing uh, that as well. Senior living, those are also, those facilities are pretty maxed out too, right? I mean, well, we're seeing some, we're seeing some. It was like, I'd, I'd be desperate to be in one of those facilities, but there's no, there's nowhere for me to go. Well, interestingly enough, we, we're finding uh, that there, there's some opening in that program. And again, I'm going to ask uh, Secretary Samuelson uh, to, to chime in. There are some struggles in certain areas, but there are certain areas that have, have uh, beds available. It, it was about my comment about uh, senior living, and uh, and that the uh, um, the question was if there is no bed capacity. Maybe you could repeat the question so I don't get it wrong, I, I guess or the statement. Your understanding of what the new bed capacity is, given that the general understanding is that's pretty maxed out. There was some money in the budget that's you know hoping to increase reimbursement rates, which hopefully will increase capacity, but um, I mean, how many new beds do you think will be available for the significant population of elderly people who are in these motels? Do we have any so, sense? Yeah, so I want to be clear. There are a number of individuals who are older adults who would qualify for other levels of care who are right now, um, you know, as the governor said, considering whether now is the time to give up their independence. For, for those who would qualify for skilled nursing, which I believe is what you're asking about, um, there are beds across the state um, that are open. We track that on a regular basis. Um, it fluctuates as many as 100 beds um, at any given time. I think what you're referring to is the capacity needs um, that we have, and uh, particularly the discharge from the hospitals. Um, and while we found that to be challenging, that's often because of the the specific needs of those individuals needing a higher level of care. So I do want to say that there are beds available. They're available across the state. The state has also worked with and is currently working with a vendor to bring on higher need uh, beds um, for those who might have mental health substance use, correctional histories. Um, they currently are not able to find a location that will come on right around the time. So it's slotted to come on in July. Um, and um, there'll be 100 beds there um, that will also be able to be prioritized um, for populations who have higher needs and can't go to one of the currently available beds. Can I also ask one more clarifying question? I'm, I'm a little bit confused by um, your statements earlier about, you know, there being a plan to kind of survey and figure out how many of these people do have a plan. Because when I asked DCF about this a few weeks ago, this was an on-the-record interview, I published these comments, you know, I asked specifically this question and I was told, because the population is transient, I don't even think that kind of survey is possible. Um, so has that changed? Is, now, is there now going to be an actual systemic effort to figure out how many of these people that are exiting are going to have some sort of, if not permanent housing, shelter or, you know, are we going to get happy, some sort of census? Yeah, I'm happy to get folks back in touch with DCF. Um, since October, we've had a cross-agency team um, that has been um, working with individuals to do care management and case management to assess what their needs are and to help them um, identify a plan and move on to permanent housing. That's included a nurse, it's included someone who is specialized in helping people find employment, uh, it's included someone who is specialized in helping navigate economic 
Veterans Services, as well as the housing partners on the ground. Um, and through that project, we have been assessing the needs and the plans of individuals who are currently in our hotel program. Again, the primary focus to help them identify and find a permanent solution and provide them the appropriate um, supports to do so. Well, the question isn't, are, you know, are there case managers talking to these folks, but is there an attempt to gather data that will be publicly available that tells us, you know, of the 2,500 people who left within this two-month period, you know, 50% found a shelter bed, you know, 10% got permanent shelter. So is there going to be that data, right, that tells us where these people went? That's different than whether or not you're talking to them and trying to identify. Yeah, thank you. I think that before, what I heard your question is, are we currently checking individuals that are currently in the program? As individuals exit the housing programs, um, we will continue to, to look at and monitor the broader agency of human services um, data, but as they exit, we may not have they, their individuals, we may not have access to where they go and what their what their plans are once they're no longer involved in uh, programs of the agency of human services. Thank you. Um, and on the subject, I have one more question. Um, for the governor, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, there's this group of Democrats that are, you know, to not vote for the budget because of this issue and uh, like you, they're hoping that uh, legislative leaders reopen the budget somehow. Of course, you know, they're coming at it from the opposite direction. Um, has that at all affected your calculus about whether or not you should sign or veto this budget bill, right? Um, it's not that I'm not aware of that, um, but I'm going to look at the glass a little bit differently uh, for those uh, who would look at that and might say, "Well, geez, we better not. You better not veto uh, the bill. It could get the budget could get worse." Uh, you know, that's what they're getting at. And I would say uh, that if we could get to a point uh, where we could agree uh, and make the the bill more palatable, uh, that we'd actually gain numbers uh, on the Republican side in particular. So, for all those who are going to vote against it, no matter what. If we made it better from my perspective, I think we could gain uh, enough uh, enough votes uh, to to make it viable. So you're saying if you do so, which you're not right. absolutely fed into, but if you do, uh, right, Republicans might if we could, join yeah, on the other side. Exactly. Okay. So it's it's a dynamic. You know, you can look at it a couple of different ways. Right. Oh. One of the things we haven't talked about much, but that, that I know is really important to a lot of people, and some significant money behind it is this SALT workaround. Um, did not make it across the finish line, and I'm wondering your thoughts, reactions to the fact yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think it's unfortunate uh, that it didn't, because it really doesn't affect our budget and uh, would put money in the pockets of, of many folks from a federal level. So I'm uh, scratching my head a bit as to why it didn't make it. Speaking of uh, federal money, um, as you know, the uh, debt ceiling talks are ongoing in Washington. It seems like one of the places that there has been some agreement is for the federal money or federal government to claw back unused pandemic COVID cash. Will that affect us in any way? Um, we don't believe so. Um, it's always a concern because you never know what they're going to claw back, uh, and that's why I kept advocating uh, for even with the IIJA money and other uh, money that we're going to be utilizing in the future that we make sure that we have the match because uh, once they start, they'll start clawing back other money as well uh, to fill gaps. So we want to make sure that it's committed. Uh, we, we believe uh, that we're in good shape there. Uh, we have programs in place. Um, it is committed. Uh, it hasn't all gone out the door, but, um, but it's all committed. So. Depending on how uh, what how they uh, uh, structure the the verbiage, um, I think I think we're okay as long as it's committed uh, to use and not uh, actually gone to the end uh, end user. I don't know if you would know where Commissioner Gresh is on. I don't see him, but about about how much money is allocated but not yet spent. I don't know if we can get that number, Kristen. Yeah. 
Kristen, uh, Secretary Clauser. So yesterday, the special committee was officially announced kind of person by person who's going to be a part of it for the Franklin County investigations. And I know it all starts in the House, but considering it's rarity, I guess, how in the loop are you expecting to be throughout this whole process, just kind of hands off? I, I don't think I'll be involved whatsoever, other than answering some of your questions. But um, this is uh, in, the, it's in the House at this point, and they'll have to do their investigation and come to some conclusion, and then uh, vote on that if they choose to do so. In a, a narrative, I guess, a through line, you still have a lot of decisions to make, as you said, but a through line with leaders in both chambers these last couple weeks of the session is essentially the governor is either vetoing or is going to veto a record amount of bills more than any other governor uh, in the state. Um, that's what they've been telling me, at least. And I guess your response to that, you mentioned just the inexperienced lawmakers, they've only been here for the good times, a lot of this federal windfall, but just, I don't know if you have a response to that or a, kind of a rationale behind why this year might be different than the past. I think, uh, you know, this is a record year of spending as well, a uh, record year of, of uh, increase in base budget expansion. Uh, I think it's at 13 percent. I don't think we've ever seen that. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a correlation between spending and vetoes. I don't know. We'll see. You, you spoke a lot on the 72-hour waiting period as well. That's going to hit your desk. Um, I just, I know you said you, you don't want to make any final decisions, but just in concept, in, in you know, in the next couple of weeks here, do you foresee vetoing that bill? It, again, it's it's on the table. We'll wait and see when we get it, and I'll make a decision at that point. But your, your thought process hasn't changed. On, no. On that. Go to the phone, starting with Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Thank you, Governor. Uh, so my question is, uh, Governor McDonough reported today that Vermont Judge Allison Arms was considering releasing an 18-year-old accused of armed robbery and drug possession, saying it's not her fault that the state doesn't and have a secure youth facility. The town of Newberry now has the support of Senator Kitchell in this opposition to the state plan to open a facility there. When and where can Vermonters expect? Yeah, I think I get, I, you cut off at the end there, Guy, but I, I think I have the flavor of the question. Um, we, are, uh, we are working on other initiatives. Uh, uh, Southern Vermont uh, Medical Center is one. Uh, there's another in Wyndham County uh, with the sheriff's office. Um, so we are working on a, a couple of other uh, ways to approach this. Uh, and we'll wait. You know, I haven't made any decision. We haven't made any decision on Newbury at this point. It's in, in the Supreme Court uh, and uh, on a technicality in terms of the um, um, restrictions uh, place or the the power of the uh, of the uh, the town. So we'll we'll wait and see how that all works out um, before making a decision to go from there. Um, can you tell me? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit more about the South Vermont Medical Center and the Wooden Frontier Office's uh, concepts? Um, I can't in detail. I don't know if uh, Secretary Samuelson has anything more on that or can research that and get back to Guy. Take a time out and, and 
um, and stabilize and then determine where a best um, longer term residential placement is. And so that identifies the second piece that's needed in our system, which is that longer term residential option. Um, what we're talking about at the Wyndham County um, Sheriff's is uh, that opportunity to do the stabilization um, when uh, before we move a, a youth on to residential treatment like you might see in Newberry. I will say that we have we continue to try to work with towns and look for partnerships across the state. Um, what I can say is, is that in the past we've st stepped forward and asked towns and providers uh, to come forward and help us find what is needed for Vermont's children. Um, and we haven't, no one has, and they're all, with each of the towns that we work with, um, there always is some um, reason that they come forward why it's not what they want in their yard. And so I really would ask Vermont towns, um, Vermont villages, to really consider what is the right thing and where, where can we site um, the facilities that we need for our highest risk children. So what happens now, there's this 18-year-old kid, the, the feds picked him up, but say they hadn't. Uh, and the judge just says, hey, there's no place to put this child. I've got to release him. Uh, there's just simply got to be a better alternative than that. Yeah, again, I want to look to working with our, our cities and towns to ensure that we have um, both stabilization and residential treatment for Vermont youth. Um, and so we'll continue uh, continue to to work through that. Um, in the absence of that, it's really falling to, to state em employees. And so for, I can't dig into this individual case, but again, we'll continue to look for and explore opportunities to do the right thing for Vermont children. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor, amongst that uh, pile of bills that you have to consider, where is uh, the housing S-100 bill on that stack? Um, um, I think that I S-100 isn't exactly what we wanted. Uh, we would have preferred having uh, more expansion in terms of uh, Act 250 reform and regulatory reform, but uh, but it's still a good bill. And, uh, and barring any technical issues with the bill, that would probably go through. But we'll take a look at it when it gets. So after examination, if it looks OK, you're, you're, you're tending to sign it. Yeah, anything will help yeah, at this point uh, oh, with housing. Great. Thank you. No, no further questions. Any others in the room? Um, just a quick follow-up to Guy Page's line of question. Is your administration still advocating for a pause in the raise the age um, uh, reforms? Um, yeah, I mean, our feelings haven't changed on that issue. I know the Department of Taxes was looking into whether or not Vermont would be able to assess a payroll tax on people who reside here but work remotely for companies based out of state. Have you got any clarification on that question? I'd like to refer to Commissioner Bolio. Yeah, I'm here, Governor. Uh, thank you for that question. Our read of the current bill is that uh, if you live in Vermont, work in Vermont for a non-Vermont employer, you would be subject to that payroll tax. And so the law would say that that employer would have to collect that payroll tax on your behalf. Thank you, Commissioner. Sure. Governor, what did you make of the Supreme Court's uh, kind of impact on this session? Obviously, the, the S.H.I.E.L.D. bill is responding to the abortion uh, decision and the Bruin case. Uh, a lot of legislators brought that up in terms of legislation they could even introduce or, or picked up this year. Um, just your thoughts on, on this report. Well, again, it's putting more pressure, maybe more authority, uh, giving it to the states, uh, which is for some, have, uh, some have always advocated for that. And uh, I think that we've reacted appropriately. Thank you all very much.